I will be reading from Genesis 6, 5 through 9. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind, who I am created, from the face of the earth, men and animals, and creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air. For I am grieved that I had made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Now, the Noah principles. I've been studying Genesis again. And I believe that 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 fundamental book of the Bible is so powerful and so important for our understanding of God and who God is and who we're supposed to be in relation to him. Many, many people in our world today doubt that there ever was a Genesis flood. And I want you to be turning your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. And we could spend the entire time talking about evidences for the Genesis flood, but I'm not going to do that. A couple of comments. In 2012, Dr. Robert Ballard, who is one of the most prominent undersea geologists and archaeologists in the world, uh, released a report of some studies that he had done in the Black Sea. You know, the Black Sea that's up there in Turkey. And uh, he went down under the Black Sea and did all kinds of explorations and found that there was another very clear shoreline far underneath the Black Sea that showed that in ancient times that had been the level of the Black Sea and that the Black Sea had been a freshwater lake, not a saltwater ocean or a saltwater sea. Uh, Dr. Ballard's explanation of this is that during the great deluge of the book of Genesis, the Mediterranean Sea rose out of its level of its table and spilled over into the Black Sea, which then became the sea that it is today. Now, this is one of the most prominent undersea archaeologists of the world today. That report was released last year. One other little fact that might be interesting to you the top of the Grand Canyon, that's where you stand and look down into it, you know, is 4,400 feet higher than where the Colorado River enters into its basin. Now, there's been a long-standing argument between evolutionists and uh, uniformitarianists, which means they think processes have been happening at the same rate all the time, and that the Colorado River's been flowing at its same rate ad infinitum back through time, and so it took millions and millions and millions and millions of years to cut that canyon, you see. There's an argument between them and the cataclysmists who believe that there was a great flood and that that was a great spillway and that massive amounts of water that had never been seen before came crashing through that land and cut that canyon in a short amount of time, you see. But here's the thing that you need to know. Since the top of the Grand Canyon is 4,400 feet higher than the place that the river enters the basin, then in order for the uniformitarian theory to be true, that river had to flow uphill for millions and millions of years. Just cogitate on that for just a little while. The Noah Principles. The Noah Principles. The great Genesis accounts talk about God. They talk about God's goodness and how that everything God made was good. They also talk about man's sin and God's response to sin and God's response to obedience. For your information, there was the first man, Adam, and his wife Eve. She is called in the book of Genesis Eve, which in Hebrew is pronounced Chava which means living, because the Bible says she was the mother of all living. So if you ever had any question about that, that solves that. She was the mother of all living. Adam and Eve had at least, probably more than this, but we know in the Bible they had Cain, Abel, and Seth. Cain murdered his brother Abel. You remember that in Genesis chapter 4. 
And Cain was banished from the Garden of Eden, and uh, he went away from God and his will. And that left them with another son. And the Bible follows the story through the lineage of that other son, Seth. The Bible says that Eve said, I have gotten me another descendant, another seed in the place of Abel. And then it says in the time of Seth, then men became, uh, began to call upon the name of the Lord. That's Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. Now that line of people, way, way back in time, who began to call upon the name of the Lord, like Abel did when he worshipped God. Those people who tried to worship God, those are the descendants of Seth in the book of Genesis chapter 5 that walk right down through if you're looking at your Bible. In Genesis 5, 24, there was a very unique man in those descendants named Enoch. And it says Enoch walked with God. And he lived so many years and he was not because God took him. See, he didn't see death. God took him. And then we come to this great uh, place in in, uh, Genesis chapter 6 where it talks about Noah. Now, among all these descendants of Seth, some of them worshiped the Lord. And in Genesis 5, 28, it says, When Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son, and he named him Noah. That's how you say it, Noah. And he said he will comfort us. The word Noah means comfort He will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. Now, I was doing my math this week, and I'm not great at math, but you go home and do yours. And I figured that Methuselah was still alive when the flood hit. And I also figured that Lamech and Methuselah and some of these others were not among those people who were walking with God. But even in his own family, Noah was unique. Even Methuselah was not among those that were walking with God. In fact, I think the great flood killed Methuselah and a bunch of other people in the line of Seth. Point number one on our outline today, only a few will walk with God. Let me read to you from Genesis 6, verse 5. Listen to this. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. But, this is the key verse here, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Can you imagine a world, look at this nice room full of folks today that have come out to worship the Lord, and we're glad that some of our elderly who are uh, not able and stuff didn't come out because we didn't want them to get hurt, but isn't this a great group of people that are here today? Isn't it wonderful that we have fellow Christians to encourage us and to help us along the way? But in that time when evil was so rampant, only Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In Luke chapter 13, verse 23, some of the disciples asked Jesus. They said, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? That's Luke 13, verse 23. And Jesus said, make every effort to enter in at the narrow door. And he began to talk to them in the down there little ways. He said, you know, many shall come from east and west and shall sit down at the kingdom of God with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you will find yourselves on the outside? He basically answered them, yes, only a few will be saved. Matthew 7, 13, enter ye in at the narrow gate, for straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that lead to life, and only a what? Only a few there be who find it. But wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that enter in thereat. 
in 1 Peter 3, it's talking about the time of Noah. And we actually know that Noah was a great preacher of righteousness and he was trying to lead his family to do right and he was trying to get his sons and his wife to do right and he was trying to appeal to his neighbors to look to God. It says in 1 Peter 3.20, When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight people, were saved in the water. In Exodus chapter 12, it tells us that 603,550 men, plus women and children left the land of Egypt in the time of Moses, freed from slavery. And out of that 603,550 men, two entered the land of Canaan, Joshua and Caleb. Because unlike those that rebelled and fell in the desert, they sought to remain faithful to God. Joshua and Caleb weren't perfect. This isn't designed to say you have to be perfect to go to heaven. No. Joshua and Caleb weren't perfect. They just kept trying to do the will of God. They just kept trying to walk with God. Just like you're trying to walk with God. Hebrews 3 verse 7. Today if you shall hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Like as in the provocation, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Don't harden your heart. Hebrews 4.11, give diligence to enter into God's rest. We can be like Joshua and Caleb. Don't have to be perfect, you just got to keep trying. In Noah's day, there was more rebellion than submission. Is that true in our day? In Noah's day, there was more selfishness in the world than unselfishness. Is that true today? In Noah's day, there were more people serving their own desires than willing to obey God. There were more people turning to their own way than turning to God's way. The rest of the world, when Noah was alive, were walking in the counsel of the ungodly and standing in the way of sinners and sitting in the seat of scoffers. But Noah's delight was in the will of the Lord. It was important to him. And it can be important to you. But let me tell you today that if you choose to walk with the Lord, you will be among the minority. You will be among the few. You will not be in the majority. You will not walk with the many. Number two, God wants to make a covenant with the few. Now, again, some of you who are prone to just have guilt running all out of you, You'll, you'll understand the few to mean the perfect. I didn't say that. God wants to make a covenant with the few who want to walk with him, who want to be with him, who want to try to do his will. Verse uh, Psalm 8, David said, When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man? that you are mindful of him, or, or the Son of Man, that you care about him. God cares about people. God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 3, 4. He wants everybody to be saved. He desires that they be saved, but his covenant, he only enters into a covenant relationship with the few that will come go with him, that will walk with him like Enoch and Noah did. He doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But God doesn't make a covenant with people unless they want to walk with him and submit to him. Listen to these verses here. This is Genesis 6, verse 17. This is God talking to Noah. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Let me show you two verses to compare. Go back to Genesis chapter 6 verse 8 where it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And now Genesis chapter 6, verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. 
God wants us to want him. He needs us. You remember that? On, I want you to want me. I need you to need me. Yeah, some of y'all are, isn't that good? No, I'm just, all right. But God feels that way. God wants you to want him. <clears throat> and it's people that want him in their lives. That's you, isn't it? It's people that want God in their lives and they're willing to walk with him. Those are the people among all the people of the earth that God is willing to enter into a covenant with. Think of this. He came to know and he said, I'm going to have a relationship with you. And when I wipe everything else out, I'm going to take care of you. In Exodus 19.5, God offered this kind of a covenant to Israel. God said, see how that on eagles' wings I have brought you out of Egypt and carried you unto myself. Now, therefore, indeed, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession from among all nations, because the whole earth belongs to me, and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the children of Israel. God made us to seek him, brothers and sisters. And it is with these seekers, seekers like Noah, seekers like Enoch, seekers like Cornelius was in the New Testament, seekers like the eunuch, people that want God in their life and are willing to walk with him. It's with those people that God wants to make his covenant. And he's offering that covenant, of course, to us today in the gospel. Number three on your outline. Following God's instructions is vital for his blessings. This is a great principle. It's a simple principle. And it's definitely in this story. God tells Noah he's going to destroy the earth. I want you to go down to Genesis 6 verse 11 and listen to the reading of God's word. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. And God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, verse 13, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So, here's the instructions. Make for yourself an ark of cypress wood, says the NIV. Gopher wood, says the King James. The Hebrew word is a non-specific word that we can't really tell what kind of wood it is, but... They knew back then what kind of wood he was talking about, so it was a specific kind of wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. This ark is to be 450 feet long. I went out in the Pacific one time on a 100-foot vessel, and I thought that was a big ship. 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side, etc. You know, God gave Noah instructions. And do you notice that those were specific instructions? Folks, the specifics of the Bible are limiting. The specifics of the Bible are narrow. That's what makes the narrow way narrow. The specifics in the Bible, those things that God specifies, make the way narrow, don't they? See, it has to be within those instructions. And Noah and his sons, for all of those years, labored. I don't know how in the world they did it. They labored and built a boat the size of the Queen Mary, and they did it just like God told them to do it. Look at some other instructions down here. Uh, in chapter 6, beginning at verse 19. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Drop down to 7-2. Take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and seven of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Those instructions are specific. They're narrow. 
And yet Noah did everything just as the Lord commanded him. Go to that next slide right there. In chapter 6, verse 22, notice what it says in the text. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Drop down to 7, 5. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Drop down to 7, 9. Male and female came to Noah and entered the ark as God had commanded Noah. Down to 7, 16. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God had commanded Noah. Noah complied with the instructions of God. Folks, this is a principle. It's a principle that is in the book of Genesis from the story of Abel to the story of Noah uh, to to the trip of Abraham. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. Go to any land? No. Go to the land that I will show you, the land of Canaan. It was specific. When the tabernacle was built, God gave specific instructions for what he wanted to be done. He gave specific instructions for the sacrifices, for the priesthood, etc. And today, God gives us specific instructions, moral and spiritual instructions for Christians From baptism to worship to Lord's Supper to the elders to family life to everything else, God gives us specifics. And in complying with those specifics, even when we don't feel like it, we have the promise of God's blessing. See, God said to Noah, Noah, if you'll just do this and this, I'll bless you. I'll take care of you. Look at that next slide and imagine this for just a moment. Can you imagine... And I don't know, I think the movie, the recent movie about that tsunami is called The Impossible. And I've started to try to watch it, but I just can't because it's too scary for me and it makes me feel too weird. But I just cannot imagine a humongous wall of water like that tsunami just wiping everything out in its path and being in the path of that thing. That's just tiny compared to this flood that we're talking about here. We cannot imagine... The cataclysm that this was. Greater than any earthquake that we've seen in our age. Greater than any volcanic eruption. Greater than any weather storm. Greater than any hurricane, Katrina or otherwise that's happened. This flood was the storm of all storms. uh, Ten ten times more powerful than anything else that's ever been in the world. The, The massive amounts of water and destruction can't even be thought about. They're so great. As what happened here. But during that cataclysm, when everything was being destroyed and it was raging, you know where Noah was? He was safe, church. He was warm. He had food. He was blessed. He was taken care of. He was reaping the promises of God. You know why? It's very simple. Because he followed God's instructions. Now, some of you, and not, don't misunderstand, I'm not saying by this that when it's ice and snow you have to get out and come to church anyway. Even if, I'm not saying that, see. But I'm saying to you that some days you don't feel like even following the simple instructions to go and worship God. Or the simple instructions to take the Lord's Supper. Or the simple instructions to pray. Or the simple instructions to tell the truth. Or the simple instructions to do whatever God says. And I don't feel like doing it every day. But let me tell you, if you just put one foot in front of the other and you keep trying to follow God's instructions. The Bible teaches that God will bless you if you'll do that. And I know that that's the truth. If you'll trust in that. And that is a great principle here from the book of Genesis. Let's look at Genesis 7 and verse 23. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Men and animals and the creatures that move along the ground. And the birds of the air were wiped out from the earth. Listen to this. Only Noah was left. And those that were with him in the ark. He followed God's instructions. They seemed weird. They seemed crazy. But he did it. And he was blessed by doing it. There's got to be a lesson in there somewhere for us. Number four today. The few who walk with God worship him acceptably. 
Did you know that before Noah entered the ark, he was a worshiper of God? In Genesis 4, verse 26, it says, Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That's in the descendants of Seth. In Genesis 12, 8, Abraham built an altar and he called upon the name of the Lord. In Genesis 13, 4, Abraham built an altar and he called upon the name of the Lord. Calling upon the name of the Lord is worship. It's worship. Noah was a worshiper of God. We're worshiping God because God has commanded us to worship Him. And we're worshiping God because we're grateful for the things that God has done for us. Those people, when they came out of the ark, Noah and his family, when they came out of the ark, they worshiped God. I want you to listen to this passage of Scripture. This is uh, Genesis chapter 8. Turn over if you have your Bible. Genesis chapter 8. This is right after they came out of the ark and they were the only people left. Then Noah, this is verse 20, Genesis 8, 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of all of the clean animals and the clean birds. This was a big worship time. And he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. And the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every imagination of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures. Why did Noah worship? What kind of worshiper was Noah? He was a submissive worshiper. He didn't do anything he wanted to. He took those clean animals, the clean ones that God had told him to bring out of the ark, and he sacrificed them. Why? Because he knew that's what God wanted. And so that's what he did. He didn't say, I'm going to do my own thing. He did what God told him to do, and he submitted. And it's that submission of the heart to God that is the sweetest and most beautiful thing in worship to God. And also, his worship arose from gratitude. You know, Monty was telling us about what God has done for us and his grace and mercy at the Lord's Supper and how thankful we are for that. And our worship arises out of gratitude and out of, the, out of appreciation for what God has done for us. They worshiped in submission. They worshiped in gratitude. The few that walk with God will do that. They'll worship God in submission and they'll worship God in gratitude. Now, this is not a complicated lesson today. The Noah principles. Here they are one more time for you. Only a few will walk with God. Will you? God wants to make a covenant with those few. Those few are not the perfect. They're the ones that keep trying. And if you follow God's instructions, you'll be blessed. And finally, if you're among those few who try to walk with God, you're going to worship God out of gratitude and out of submission. Well, it's good to be with you today. There may be somebody here who wants to obey the gospel this morning. There may be someone here who needs special prayers. If we can help you, please come as we stand together and as we sing.